Take your Bibles, if you would, Matthew chapter 1. I'm going to have a little bit of a Christmas message for you, but um, we're going to talk about today, uh, two different titles to this can be, How to Handle Bad News, or How to Handle the Stress of Christmas. Uh, how many of you get at least sometimes stressed during the holidays? Okay, uh, Don't raise your hand, men, but how many of your wives get stressed? All right. You're not supposed to raise your hands. Good night. Uh, just had three divorces because of that. All right. You know, the fact is, is often when we face bad situations, we face bad news, we face struggles, which happens a lot in holidays. All of a sudden you find out that 10 more people are coming for Christmas dinner. What do you do? Uh, you, you find out that the present that you just bought for $300, so somebody else just bought that too. And so you have a lot of different stress, and we tend to be that way. I was reading through scripture here, and I was amazed to see at the poise and the attitude that Joseph had as he was dealing with this. You think about it as Joseph had to uh, face this. It wasn't all just a bed of roses for him because uh, he was dealing with all of a sudden he finds out that uh, his fiance is pregnant and he knows it's not his. And then angels come to him and he's dealing with a really frustrating situation. And we're going to talk and read about that today. Let's take our Bibles, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, we'll start in verse 18. The Bible says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then, her, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from the sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. And he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for loving us. I pray that as we go through different times in our life, we face bad news as we go through the holidays, that we will recognize that you need to be in control, that we'll keep our demeanor and our attitude in check, and that we'll handle ourselves in a godly manner. Lord, I pray that you'd help my mind frame as I speak today, help me to go in the direction that you want me to go. Lord, I pray that we'd walk away wanting to be closer to you today. In Jesus' name, Amen. Bad situations often happen in our lives. Bad news happens often in our lives. Christmas happens every year, which yields stress and uh, frantic craziness. So we had our Christmas party last night for our, um, our youth staff, and I took the high road. Um, I did not cook last night. Uh, Rico's is right around the corner from my house, and it was much easier to pick up the phone and have Rico's than to cook last night. That was stress-free, amen? <laughs> but we often face different battles and troubles because of the stress in our life. Um, yeah, I read an article. It said that using desserts help with stress. How many think desserts help with stress, all right? It, it went on to say that it only, it, it's only natural that stressed out people eat more desserts because stress spelled backwards is dessert. So if that's true, there's a lot of stress between Thanksgiving and New Year's because a lot of you eat a lot of dessert during that time. My wife on Thanksgiving made a pecan 
pie cheesecake. It was half pecan pie, half cheesecake. You set one right there, your tongue will snap your brain out trying to get to it. It was amazing. But often we use a lot of different coping mechanisms like desserts to deal with our stress. We, we want to make it go away. We want to make the bad news go away. Unfortunately, sometimes we use anger to deal with that stress. Um, I don't know if you're a Charlie Brown fan, but in one of the Peanuts cartoons, Lucy says to Charlie, says, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole wide world. Charlie says, but I thought you had inner peace. And Lucy replied, I do have inner peace, but I still have outer obnoxiousness. You know, many of us, as we deal with situations, as we deal with frustration, as we deal with bad news, we want to say, I have the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. But unfortunately, we still have outer obnoxiousness. We still have frustration. And it shows in so many different ways. A young mother was driving her little boy down the street. The little boy asked, Mommy, why do the idiots only come out when Daddy drives? Mommy replied, because daddy has a problem. You know, we have to realize that we cannot handle situations in a wrong way. Here we see that Joseph came and he finds out that his fiance is pregnant to be his wife. It's not his. And can you imagine how... The, you would feel in that position, in that mind frame, trying to work through it all and trying to figure out your emotions. And we see here, though, he didn't even know that it was the Holy Ghost at that point when he found out that it was conceived by the Holy Ghost. He, he did not know it was the Son of God at that point. But we were going to explore how he still handled it in the right way. We see here, he did not blow up. He did not make rash decisions. He did not jump and go crazy. A lady once came to Billy Sunday and attempted to rationalize her angry outburst. She said, there's nothing wrong with losing my temper. I blow up and then it's all over. And many of us, we have that attitude. Uh, well, I got over it. You know, I had my little blow up. I had, uh, I just needed to get it all out. That's one of those expressions that make us feel better about our anger. But Billy Sunday replied, so does a shotgun. And look at the damage it leaves behind. We don't recognize at how our spirit, when we handle situations, affects so many other lives. And affect our testimony for Jesus Christ. So I want to look at Joseph and how he handled uh, this frustration of Christmas in a right way. How he handled bad news in a right way. Number one, let's look at his reasoning. His reasoning. He first acted justly rather than emotionally. He first acted justly rather than emotionally. You know, when he got the news uh, about this, he being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. You know, he took and he handled things in a right way. When you face bad problems, do you act or do you react? Our problem is, is we follow Newton's law for every action. There is an op uh, opposite and equal reaction. Well, if this is done, I must do this. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. If they're going to be that way, then this is what I'm going to do. But we don't see that, that he first acted justly. He first acted carefully as he handled the situation. You know, often in our wisdom... We don't handle things in that way. We often react much louder, much harsher. Back, back in the day when uh, Mr. Rockefeller owned um, the Standard Oil Company, a senior executive had uh, made a mistake that cost the company back then $2 million. In today's dollars, it would be a, about $15 million mistake. 
Praise the Lord, I have never made a $15, $15 million mistake at First Baptist Church, all right? I have made a $15 mistake and much more than that, but never a $15 million mistake. John, John D. Rockefeller, in dealing with it, was working on figuring out how to handle the problem, and as usual, all the corporate and executive heads were hiding from Mr. Rockefeller because they were afraid of his wrath. They were afraid of how he was going to handle things. And uh, they were afraid that everything was going to come down. But there was one exception. There was an Edward T. Bedford who was a partner in the com company. And he had an appointment with Rockefeller that day. And instead of being afraid, he kept that appointment, even though he was prepared to listen to all the trauma and the trouble of how they had lost $2 million. When he entered into the office of Mr. Rockefeller and his oil empire, he, Mr. Rockefeller sat there writing on a piece of paper and was filling out a bunch of notes. So Mr. Bedford stood there silently and just waited. After a few minutes, Mr. Rockefeller looked up and said, Oh, it's you, Bedford. He said calmly, I suppose you've heard about our loss. Mr. Bedford said, Yes, he had. He said, I've been thinking it over, and before I asked the man that made the mistake in to discuss the matter, I've been making some notes. Mr. Bedford later told the story that across the top of the page was written, points in favor, and the man who had made the mistake's name was there. There followed a long list of the man's virtues, including a brief description of how he had helped the company make the right decision on three separate occasions that had earned them many times more of the money than of the money that he had lost in his heir. Mr. Bedford said, I never forgot that lesson said in later years when I was tempted to rip into anyone, I forced myself to first sit down and thoughtfully compile a long list of good points about that person. Invariably, by the time I finished my inventory, I would see its true perspective and keep my temper under control. There is no telling how many times this habit prevented me from committing one of the most costliest mistakes an executive can ever make, losing my temper. You know, the fact is, is we look at the immediate moment and we feel better when we allow ourselves to explode and get upset rather than being a just man and dealing with things in the right way. Joseph took and he dealt with things in a right way. He was not willing to make her a public example. He was a just man. He was patient. And as he came into the situation... He dealt with things carefully. You know, when you deal with a situation, do you look at a person's positives or are you focused on their negatives? Pastor Willette often taught us that when we deal with situations, I'm kind of a hyper person. I, I am a reactory person. And one thing that often would help me is the same principle that if I'll just sit and be still, if I'll just sit and wait and I'll weigh the person's positives rather than just focusing on a person's negatives, it keeps me in check. We see that Joseph was good. See, he was that just man. The, the Greek root for that word just is diakos. And the definition is innocent, holy, and righteous judgment. You know, rather than coming and immediately judging her, he was willing to put away her privately and he was careful in the way that he dealt with it. He said that he was not willing to make her a public example. And so he, put, he said, I'll just set her over to the side here and we'll keep this really quiet. Think about this. Put yourself in this position. Would you say, okay, let's just keep this quiet? Here, it, it looked like, and the evidence showed that he had been hurt and that he had been betrayed by his fiance. And here she is walking around with someone else's child besides his. Can you imagine what the normal human being would be doing? Oh, you all need to know that's not mine. I, I, I was careful. I'm a godly man. I didn't do wrong. That's not mine. And make her a 
public example. You know, back in Bible times, they had the ability for this sin to kill them. But he chose and said, let's just keep this quiet. Is your tendency when you face bad problems to be quiet and slow and just and have righteous judgment? Or is it to take and prove your innocence? Is it to be loud? Is it to be frustrated? Is it to uh, make things public and declare your innocence? Question for you today. Which way would you act in this situation? Which way would you respond? How would you handle this situation? You know, we have to take and learn to humble ourselves. We need to have that righteous judgment in our life. And then we need to be willing that when we deal with a situation, to, it doesn't always have to go public. You can sit back and be quiet, and you can be soft, and you can wait. In my impetuousness, I often feel like something has to be dealt with right now. I often feel like something has to be brought to the point. But I can't tell you how many times by just waiting I get to where I need to go. The next thing we see here is his restraint. Um, here he takes in verse 19, it says, Being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But that next statement in verse 20, But while he thought on these things. While he thought on these things. You know, the fact is, is we have to take and be patient as we're dealing with frustrating situations. See, Number one was he, he was pondering an action rather than having a reaction. Um, he took and instead of blowing up and getting upset and getting really frustrated with everything around him, he said, you know, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to hit the pause button. Uh, a long time ago, Pastor Willette taught me the 24-hour rule. If I will just wait at least 24 hours to react to a situation. One, a lot of truth is revealed in those 24 hours. Think about it. Here, a truth was revealed to Joseph. He sat back and he was pondering these things. And the next statement was, while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Uh, when the people of Israel were taken and they knew what was going to happen at the Red Sea, but they didn't listen and they all were going crazy and they're all ready to kill Moses. Moses stood up and said, stand still, fear not, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Often we don't get to see the salvation of the Lord because we don't stand still. Hey, if he hadn't pondered, uh, he might not have been in the right place for the angel because he went all crazy. Joseph handled himself in a patient manner and he was pondering in action rather than having a reaction. He said, I'm going to wait to see what happens. The second thing we see here is the Bible tells us that we need to be still. The Bible says in Psalms 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. One of the things that is most against our human nature is this being patient and being still. In the book of James, the Bible says, the trying of our faith worketh patience, that we may be perfect, wanting nothing. We often are not patient. We often do not wait. We often don't see how God has something special for us and we wait on it. We want to react and we want to make things happen in our own life. We've got to come to the point that as we deal with situations that we sit back and we listen. We sit back and we ponder the situations. We sit back and say, God, I don't know how to deal with this situation, but Lord, please reveal truth. God, please show me how this can change. Parents, one of the greatest things you can do with your children 
is be patient with them. I understand that children can be very irritating. I can understand that children can be obnoxious at times. I can understand that they can be pushing on you and uh, it's easy to get frustrated. I can understand how when you, they're talking and you find out about something you did, your first response is, you did what? But in that moment, one of the greatest gifts that you can give your children is patience. One of the greatest gifts you can give is to be still and be patient as you handle that situation. I'm not saying not doing anything. I'm not saying placating them. I'm saying just sit back and be still and ponder the whole situation. I was working on practicing this and uh, I have three children, Kaylin, Austin, and Jordan. Uh, Kaylin's graduated from college. The other two are in college, so I can talk about them all I want. They're not here. But one time, Austin, we had a rule. Uh, he had a cell phone. He was, I believe, in the 10th grade. And the rule was you get to keep your cell phone, but you only get to communicate with Guys, I said, I don't want you using that cell phone to communicate with girls. We, I was a meanie. We had some structure as far as relationships. And I said, you're in 10th grade. I don't want you having a relationship. I don't want you to have a lot of friendships with girls right now. I want you to wait. And so therefore, right now, uh, you don't communicate with girls. And I said, if you communicate with a group of girls, that's fine. But do not communicate one-on-one -on -one with a girl. I don't want you texting a girl. I don't want you calling a girl. And you stay away from that. And as long as you can do that, you can keep your phone. Well, I'm driving my car, and Austin's in the back, and you know your children. You can tell when your kids are talking to a member of the opposite sex. They get a look in their eyes, you know. That stargaze, and they, you know. So Austin's face had that look on it, and I could tell that boy is not talking to a boy. He has the wrong look on his face, or something's wrong with him, all right? So... I, I, I was watching him, and I said, Austin, who are you talking to? No one. <laughs> Immediately, I wanted to grab the cell phone and chuck it out the window. I said, Austin, let me see your cell phone. He passes it up. I look, and what he was doing was he was not texting a girl. He was in a group chat with one girl. All right, so he said, I was group chatting, yeah, with one person. I'm looking at it, and rage is going through my eyes. I was thinking of every way to destroy that cell phone. I was thinking of every way to destroy him. And the Holy Spirit said, be still. He said, you don't want to react in anger right now. I think my other Holy Spirit, my wife, put her hand on my arm, which, you know, she could see the tension. And I took the phone, and I tossed it back to him. And he said, Dad, why are you giving me the phone back? And I said, Son, I am very frustrated right now, and I don't know what God wants me to do, and we're going to wait and see. He said, So I can have my phone back? I said, For now. And I just started praying about it. I prayed about it, and the next day, Austin walked up, and he was almost in tears, and he said, Dad, I violated your trust. He said, you allow me to have a cell phone. You pay for my cell phone. You have simple rules with this cell phone. And he said, I bent the rules to get what I wanted. He said, would you please forgive me? And I said, yes. He said, why don't you take my cell phone away for two weeks? It was easy. <laughs> Parenting shouldn't be that easy, you know. But do you know why I got such a good result? Because I got out of the way. Because I allowed myself to ponder the reaction rather than having a reaction to the situation. And I was still, and I was able to see good results. I will not go and tell you all the times that I was a jerk and an idiot and I didn't do that, all right? Where I lost it and I got mad with my children and I hurt my testimony and I hurt my relationship with them. But that was a time where I could remember that I handled myself as a just man. I handled myself in a careful way, followed the illustration of Joseph, and was able to have good results. 
The third thing we see here is his, re first is his reasoning and then was his restraint. Lastly is his respect. You know, he obeyed God rather than himself. Uh, in the book Changed into His Image, it says two choices on the shelf, loving God or loving self. Two choices on the shelf, serving God or serving self. Our flesh wants to take and we want to react in uh, uh, adverse situations and we want to fight and we want to control. But we have to set ourselves aside and we have to obey God. When you face situations, you have a choice. I can be a just man and have righteous judgment by walking in Christ. Or I can take and I can sit back and I can handle things the way I think I need to handle. I need to either make myself feel better or I can handle things the godly way. You know, at his first response was not a godly response. It was a human response. His human reasoning was to put her away. As you look at scripture. Before the angel came to him, he said, fine, I'll just put her away. But we see that there was a different response after the angel came and he got the word of the Lord. Do you allow the word of God to override your thinking? The Bible says, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Do you allow the word of God to take and say, you know, often when I start to get offended, uh, Holy Spirit says, hey, dummy, what part of nothing shall offend them do you not understand? And the question for you is, do you handle yourself in a way that you can overcome those battles because you allow the word of God and his truth to become greater than the situation? See, it's a matter of faith. One day, John Wesley was walking with a troubled man who expressed his doubt of, uh, as to the goodness of God. He was frustrated. He was mad about lots of situations. And he said, I do not know what I shall do with all this worry and trouble. At the same moment, Wesley saw a cow looking over a stone wall. Do you know, asked Wesley, why that cow is looking over the wall? No, said the man who was worried. Wesley said, the cow is looking over the wall because she cannot see through it. That is what you must do with your wall of trouble. Look over and avoid it. Faith enables us to look past our circumstances and focus on Christ. We have to take and stop looking at the problem and look at our God. We have to take and recognize that God is greater than anything else and God wants to work miracles in our life and God wants to take care of situations, but we often don't let him because we have to control it and take care of it ourselves. We must stop and allow God to take care of those worries. We must stop and put our faith in that he's got it covered. His second thing we see about his respect is his spiritual reasoning was to obey God and his word. So his human reasoning was, I'm going to put her away. But his spiritual reasoning, he listened to the word of God through the angel. And he did exactly as he was told. You know, you, many of you come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Many of you, you read your Bible every day. But my question for you in this area of being a just man, in this area of handling situations in a wise way, do you obey and apply scripture? Do you set aside your human reasoning? Do you set aside your human philosophy and take the spiritual reasoning of the word of God and apply it to your life on a day-by-day -day basis as you deal with people, as you deal with stress? You know, when things don't work out right, just sit back and say, this is a time God's going to get to work. When things don't seem to be lining up well, you can say, this is a time for God to work. When people are frustrating you and you feel like the world is full of idiots, you just sit back and say, this is a time that I get to see my God work. A young girl unaccustomed traveling was taking a 
train ride through the country. And it happened that that train ride had to cross multiple river branches and several wide streams. And uh, she knew the path and she would see the water coming up. And she'd start to fear the water. And how is the bridge going to get across this water? She didn't understand how a big train could safely cross across that water. Till she drew near to the first crossing and a bridge appeared. And she was able to take and cross that bridge. As she approached the next major river, she could see the river but not the bridge, and she began to worry again. But as she got close, she could see the bridge again. After two or three times of this experience repeated, she looked up at her mother with a long breath and a strong relief of confidence. Somebody has put up bridges all the way for us, she told her mother. As you face life, God has bridges. You're going to have battles. You're going to have rivers that you have to cross. You're going to have the things that are, look like they're terrible. But here we see that this terrible situation that looked like it was terrible was actually one of the greatest events in history. It was the beginning of the birth of our Christ. But Joseph had to handle himself in a godly manner and be a just man for these components to come together correctly and fulfill pro prophecy. Today, let's decide that as we face battles, as we face struggles, as we face trials, as we face crazy people, that we're going to focus and our reasoning is going to be spiritual reasoning rather than humanistic reasoning. That our reasoning is going to follow Scripture and the Word of God rather than follow our own flesh. If we'll allow God to do that, great things will happen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for what you're doing in our lives. Lord, thank you how when we walk with you, all things work together for good. I pray that we would recognize the areas where we allow the human reasoning to rule our brains rather than spiritual reasoning. Lord, help us to humble our minds. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, who would say, you know, Pastor Scott, as you spoke today, I could identify some areas where maybe I don't handle problems in the right way. I can see where I allow stress to rule my life and human reasoning to rule my life rather than spiritual reasoning. And today I need to make some decisions and make some changes. Pray for me. Would you raise your hand so I could pray for you? Amen. 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 Who else? There's some things that need to change in my reasoning. Who else? Amen. Amen. Is there anybody here who would say, you know, Pastor Scott, I, I don't know how to have godly reasoning because if I died today, I don't know for sure I'd go to heaven. I've never asked Jesus to come into my heart and forgive me of my sins and take me to heaven when I die, but I'd sure like to know that. Pray for me. Is there anybody like that here today? Would you raise your hand so I could pray for you? All right. Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And the piano is going to play. And if God spoke to your heart, come on down and get down at an altar and say, God, this is what needs to change. God, help me go from human reasoning to spiritual reasoning. Be with me during this holiday season and have the right mind frame. Have the right attitude. Help me handle battles in the right way. Lord... Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your spiritual truths. Lord, I pray that you'd help me focus on the right thought processes as I deal with stress and problems during this holiday season. Guide and direct our steps now be with this invitation. And Lord, if someone doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, I pray that today they would accept you. In Jesus' name, amen.